Hello, hello, and welcome once again to our Beatles program, a podcast that we call Things We Said Today. This is a show that focuses mainly on what's going on in the Beatle world in terms of Beatle news, which happens pretty much every single day. I'm Ken Michaels, and many of you know me for being the host of a syndicated Beatles show called Davy Little Thing, and I'm being joined by my co-host, who is actually in celebratory mood, or mode, mood. maybe, mode. because his San Francisco Giants just won the World Series. So uh, if he seems a lot more up in this particular program than you're used to hearing, then that's why. Or maybe he's had a little bit of bubbly. You never know. No. No? You stay away from that? No, not, uh, not at this time of the day. Um, no, but I'm... I'm, I'm I am in celebration mode. They had the parade today, and, and we we watched it. So, yeah, it's been a great day. Well, good for oh. you. Hi, everybody. I always, I'm, I'm a National League fan, so I will vote for the National League team. Did you, say my, did you say my name just then? I don't think you did. I think I interrupted you. Okay. So, just in case I neglected to say your name, Steve, it's Steve Marinucci from Beatles Examiner. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hi, everybody. On today's show, we're going to talk about something that Paul McCartney said in an interview that he gave to legend David Frost in uh, a TV show that he's hosting now. He's, uh, I think he's trying to make a comeback of sorts. And this is a 60-minute interview that he did on, on television. And um, so this covered you know, a lot about Paul's career. And he had some things to say about the Beatles, and in particular about Yoko, which I thought was kind of interesting. And actually, it must have garnered a lot of attention because when I go to uh, my Yahoo page, the home page, and you take a a look at the most uh, viewed uh, news items, it reads, Paul about Yoko. (laughs) So that was one of the most viewed Uh, news stories, at least as we speak right now. So why don't you, Steve, tell the folks what this is all about, what Paul had to say about Yoko. Well, first of all, the interview was taped for a program to air in November, and it will air on Al Jazeera English. Hmm. Okay. And what Paul said was addressing the question of the long-standing feeling that Yoko broke up the Beatles, he said, she certainly didn't break the group up. The group was breaking up. And then he also said, I, uh, he also talked about how Yoko inspired Lennon to uh, write songs like Imagine. And he said, I don't think he would have done that without Yoko, so I don't think you can blame her for anything. When Yoko came along, part of her attraction was her avant-garde side, her view of things. So she showed him another way to be, which was very attractive to him. Okay. And there's there's even more than that, but I think the interesting part of this is the direct statement that Yoko didn't break up the Beatles. The funny thing about this is it's been said before, mm-hmm. and he said it before. Uh, and the, it's funny that Everybody picked up on this like, you know, this was the first time, and it's really not. And I mean, it's what's even more surprising, though, is the reaction from people who seem like they haven't heard this before. Right. And that there is still a feeling, and there is still a feeling out there, actually. If you go, you know, if you talk to people, if you look on message boards, you know, there are still people that believe, especially people who are not really, really fans, I mean, among the general public, there's still a feeling by some people that she did break up the Beatles. And it's such a ridiculous notion that she did. And there's many reasons that I, that I feel. That well, you know, a, a lot of fans, though, don't really follow the history. You know, they're going by their own gut reaction. Right. And I remember, I remember when, actually, the very first Beatles fest I attended in Los Angeles was the one where Cynthia Lennon appeared. And she mentioned Yoko, and I remember the booze, the booze came loud and long. Mm. Because there was a lot of 
you know, she had a lot of bad feeling, obviously, toward Yoko. And there was a lot of agreement with her. And I don't think, I don't know that, you know, that people were actually saying that she broke him up, but I mean, there was a lot of bad feeling, I guess, toward her involvement in the, in the marriage, in making John and Cynthia's marriage split up. I guess you could say that they could, you know, she made them split up because she was the other woman. But, you know, the fact that there is some bad feeling, you know, against Yoko, and it's crazy. In, I agree with field. you. I agree with because, you totally. Yeah. Because one of the things that I was I was in I was arguing this on uh, Facebook the other day that you can't blame Yoko and not not also mention Linda because Linda was there too. Mm-hmm. Linda and the kids were there, and so it's not fair that Yoko get targeted, and she still does. I mean, headline writers all the time use the oh no phrase, you know, every time they bring up Yoko's name, and it's really kind of crazy that they do that. Mm-hmm. And every now but, and then, you'll find something in the media, like say in a TV show, where her name is referenced in a bad way, as though she is what's going to lead to the breakup of something. It, her name is used in that context, and I've seen it happen every now and then, and I'm just grimacing when I see it happen. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I, I agree with you totally. I can't believe that in this day and age, and we're in 2012 as we're doing this, 42 years after the Beatle breakup, and there are fans who still feel this way. Sometimes I go to, like, the Fest for Beatle fans, and I'll see bumper stickers that read, Still Pissed at Yoko. And I can't believe, yeah, I mean, what year are you living in? It's like a caveman mentality here. First of all, as far as John and Yoko are concerned, it was John's choice to be with her. And, right. you know, you have a right to feel whichever way you want to about her music, her art. No one's forcing you to like that. But if you don't respect the fact that this was John's choice, then it's like you're not respecting John. Do you, let me ask a question. And actually, I'm going to throw this concept out there. Do you feel there's, there's kind of an undercut of racism involved as far as the feeling about Yoko? I never encountered that. I never felt like the reason why people hate her is because she's Japanese. I think that most people, when they when they have this feeling, it has more to do with that she, because of her influence, led John away from the Beatles. And also in a different direction, maybe in a uh, different direction that he would not have gone if he didn't meet her. Maybe in the politics, whatever. You know, it carries over to a lot of different things. It's I don't like... Think it was- I don't think it was the politics. I don't think it was the politics because, I mean, I think a lot of Beatle fans agreed with their politics. For example, the them getting involved in the um, the People's um, Park um, thing that was something that you know at the time Beatle fan a lot of Beatle fans agreed with. So I don't see that the politics necessarily split it. I think when you compare reaction to Linda and the reaction to Yoko, I, I do think there is some kind of a subtle I don't know, I, you know I hate to say racist, but I mean and I'm not calling fans racist at all, but I'm saying I, the reaction just doesn't make sense, you know, that it's inconsistent between Linda and, and I mean they both came into their lives they both played similar roles in terms of influencing their art, they both sang with them. Mm-hmm. They both, you know, they, yeah, they both but, played with them. But musically and in terms of art, well, Linda had the the career as a photographer, but Yoko was, without question, the biggest influence ever on John's life. And I know <laughs> there there are so many other artists that influenced John, especially the fifties rockers and. And in the 60s, artists like Bob Dylan, for example. But overall, the one person that affected him the most in how he viewed art and music, who really turned his head around, was Yoko. And it was all, you know, a lot of it had to do with the avant-garde scene and this whole idea that everything that you create can be conceived as art. And And John was fascinated by that, and he wanted to pursue a path with Yoko in that direction. And that was something that, the Beatles would probably have never agreed to. 
and there's one thing that you find if you when you talk to Yoko, which I've I've talked to her on two occasions. I've interviewed her three times, but the third time was an email. But in talking to her, she's a very direct person. Hmm. And she's the type of person that you have the, you know, the concept that John was. You know, John, John was always thought to be a very forceful person, a very tell-it-like-it-is person. And she's that way. Yeah. She's that way. I, uh, I saw her when she gave uh, a lecture at Stanford a couple of years ago, and it was an incredible night. The, what she did and the way she showed her art on stage to everybody and, and the demonstration that she that she gave. I mean, she, she even did a, a kind of a, she did even part of a cut piece that night, which was really right. kind of astounding. And she got the audience involved, and that's what her art is, and that's one of the things that attracted John to her was her concept of art. Right. And... The whole thing, to me, the whole idea of avant-garde art is that it makes you think. It just makes you think, is this art? Or shall we take this seriously? You know, it's just getting you to think about that. Right. Some people might think that walking up a stepladder and taking a magnifying glass and seeing the word yes <laughs> on the top of a ceiling, what kind of work is there in that? Some people might think that's brilliant. And who's to say who's right and who is wrong? There are so many fans out there who are Beatle fans that can't grasp that kind of artistic uh, type of work or statement. And I'm not saying that it's necessarily brilliant and you have to feel that way, but all that it's getting you to do is to think about it. And John was just, you know, completely consumed with this, with Yoko, and he had a right to be. So I don't really... And another thing is that, and John even said this himself, that... When you say John, it's really John and Yoko as one word. And that's how he thought at that time, that everything they do, they do together. And even Paul has said that even though he doesn't have any resentment towards Yoko for, for breaking up the Beatles, it was uncomfortable when she was there in the studio with them. So, you know, you hear those things, and a lot of fans pick up on it. And you know, This happened with Yoko more than any other wife. And I think one thing also, it's kind of interesting, something that John and Paul both share in common is that they both want their women to be, you know, someone that has a good head on their shoulders. Someone, right. someone that, um, you know, isn't just going to be a dutiful housewife. And it, there, there's an interesting parallel between the two, you know, when you think about it. Yoko was involved artistically, so was Linda. They, they weren't just... They weren't just secondary uh, people. They didn't take backstage or uh, back seats to mm -hmm. each man. They were up there equally. And like I said, when you talk to Yoko, you really get the impression that she was an equal with John. There was no playing secondary. There was no second role for her. She's very direct. You really get, in fact, it was funny that the first time I talked to Yoko, I came away feeling like I knew what John felt because she is just that she is so direct and so forceful and and so upfront. And right. You you get the impression that that's what attracted John to her. And some fans are put off by that. Right. It's they fine are. for John to be that way but not Yoko. Right. But you know I I kind of disagree with one thing you just said Steve because where Linda's concerned, I always felt like the main reason that she was part of Paul's music is because Paul wanted her there. She didn't force herself on Paul. And I don't think she ever felt like she was Paul's equal in the music. She just enjoyed being there and to support him. But when it came to something like causes, like animal rights, there, you know, she, she had a presence and she was forceful and she asserted herself in that role. So I, in, I, in, in that regard, I would say there's a similarity there between Linda and Yoko. But I musically, guess. I always felt that, you know, it didn't matter that much to Linda. She was there because she loved Paul and she wanted to compliment his music and she enjoyed doing it. But I don't think she ever felt like she was an equal when it came to the music. I thought that Linda was there 
that Paul actually put her there because of Yoko, um, kind of. In other words, Yoko became a force in John's music. Lin- uh, Paul wanted to have Linda kind of do the same thing. It's possible. Um, I've never heard Paul admit it, though. No, I've never heard him admit it either, but because there were just so many things that they did, you know, back and forth to each other, you know, kind of a, I, I, I don't want to say tit for tat, but, you know, they oh, so many things were in peril, or parallel between the two of them that it's hard not to think that that was one of the reasons, especially in Linda's case, since she was more of a photographer and she wasn't originally a singer i think part of the inspiration for getting linda into the group was was that was that yoko was was doing something musically with john Hmm. i think that's very possible but one thing there to to continue with what paul said in this interview that i found interesting is giving yoko credit for a song like imagine which john in fact has done he had done because the inspiration behind imagine came from Yoko's book Grapefruit, where in her poetry she would keep saying, imagine this, imagine that. But uh, he later said that he was too cowardly to give Yoko a songwriting credit on the song. But just the mere fact that Paul is now saying that Yoko was this big influence on John's music, I think that's a big step for him because I don't really recall Paul saying that. And in a way, it kind of reminds me a lot. And there was an article uh, that just came out regarding this interview that Paul gave David for us, where he made the parallel between an interview that John gave to David Wig in 1971, which we will frequently mention here on this show because it's a very intense interview that John gave. This was the angry John in 1971. He was definitely in, in that mode. And um, he was talking about how the public won't accept change regarding the Beatle breakup and... Uh, I think he said the overground is just the same as the underground and they don't like change. And he said, if it is Linda and Yoko's fault for breaking up the Beatles, and it's interesting because he always put Linda in the same sentence, right? maybe to soften the blow so that he wouldn't just say Yoko. But he said, if it is Linda and Yoko's fault for breaking up the Beatles, can they have the great credit for all the solo music that they had put out at that point? And I really applauded John for saying that. Because I happen to agree with them wholeheartedly about that, because they put out a lot of great solo music. I think for people who have never fully accepted the Beatle breakup, Yoko is the easy target, more so than Linda, for that reason, because she was really shown to be such a a strong presence and influence on John. I don't really think that the public felt that way about Linda uh, towards Paul. But you know something? Because you just mentioned this, and and I was just thinking about something, about the whole racism aspect. And I was just saying that from my perspective, I never encountered that. But I do believe that if you watch the Lennon NYC documentary, John and Yoko talk about that, or Yoko talks about that in England in particular, that they felt a lot of racism. And I seem to recall that last year, uh, Sean complained about that on Twitter, that there had been some of that reaction against his mother. He was, he, in one really angry outburst, he, he got, he got really ticked off about that. Right. Uh, and one thing we didn't, we didn't really get to was that if Yoko didn't break up the Beatles, who did? Well, and, that, that opens up a can of worms because that is a very complicated topic. And I've always maintained that there are a lot of reasons why the Beatles broke up. But the one thing that will be the most debatable is, what's the most important reason? You can go back and forth between the business disagreement, whether or not, you know, the whole Alan Klein affair, if that was the biggest reason that John, George, and Ringo wanted Alan Klein to represent uh, the group as their business manager and Paul wanted the Eastmans. Some people will say that was the biggest reason. Other people will say it was artistic differences, and, and they, the Beatles, all four of them, wanted to go in different directions musically. Right. So right. then there's the, the whole concept of the four of them were growing up. And they all had which women is, of their own. Which, and, is, yeah. well, my, which is what I believe. I, I believe that, that they were pretty much growing up. I know after I wrote this last set of articles, Ray Connolly 
who everybody knows is a veteran British journalist who covered the Beatles, you know, in the day. He mentioned the Alan Klein thing too, and and I think the Alan Klein thing had a lot to do with it too. Definitely. Uh, Paul obviously did not like um, Alan Klein, and he was he it was him against the other three. In fact, he says that in the interview, he says. I was fighting against the other three guys who had been my lifelong soul buddies. I said I wanted to fight Klein. So they were at loggerheads with each other for that. And uh, and that's, you know, that was a big reason. It certainly yeah. was, but was it the overriding biggest reason? You can, yeah. always, you can ar- always argue the fact that there were certain songs that were recorded that certain Beatles didn't like. I'm sure you've heard that uh, John, and I think George as well, really didn't like Maxwell Silver Hammer. And John didn't like Obla Dio Obla Da. I think that John looked at this whole idea of being in a group as being too confining. He wanted complete freedom to do whatever he wanted to do. Whether it was recording something that was more commercial like the Ballad of John and Yoko, or something like What's the New Mary Jane? He wanted that freedom, and I think that, and he says that in the David Wing interview, not in those words, those exact words, but, you know, I've said this before, even with a group like the Beatles that put out this tremendous catalog, what most of us will say is the greatest catalog ever, there's still limitations when you have a band. And right. when you put together a new album, I'm sure John had to say, well, Ringo's got to have his one vocal. We've got to make sure George has his two songs in there, and the rest should be evenly divided between him and Paul. And sometimes they weren't, and that upset John. You have all those problems. And so you know, I think all, all these different reasons, and probably some that we haven't even gotten into, you know, there are a lot of reasons why I think the Beatles broke up. I've said for the longest time that I think that the four of them really loved each other and they went through so much together that one reason alone couldn't have split them apart and then we haven't even talked about George Harrison and the fact that I think that deep down even though he was always fighting having an ego it, he kind of resented always being held to one or two songs on a Beatle album or three songs if he was lucky like on Revolver especially later on when, when, his, when he really started to get creative yeah you know. And I also believe, and this is just my opinion, I'm not saying this is fact, but just judging by some of the things that John said, I think that he was jealous of Paul and the fact that Paul was as prolific as him and coming up with as many songs or, in his mind, more songs than him. And he resented it when Paul had more hits or he had the A-sides over him. And then imagine not only having to have to deal with someone who is your equal, like Paul, and then there's George Harrison really flourishing towards the end. So, you know, you have that aspect as well. There were ego problems within the group, and the whole thing is, there's nothing that's more important to me where the Beatle breakup is concerned than what the four of them have said about it, because nobody knows it better than those four and the people who are around them. What we know is basically what we've read in books and from listening to interviews. And there's no doubt that You know, much of what we're saying is true, but the simple fact of the matter is, if you were to ask each of the four Beatles what was the biggest reason behind the breakup, they might give you four different reasons. And they may give you different reasons at different times in their lives. And they'd all be true. (laughs) So it's a very complicated thing. It's a complicated web. You know, I'd love to be able to say it was Alan Klein and that's it. But I, I really do think that even if they agreed on the same manager, they would have had all these other problems festering I, th- I think to put it you know con- concisely it was because they grew up I think that's the easiest reason I think that covers everything you know everything that that there is to cover that is what happened they grew up you know they fell in love they they started getting different tastes you know uh, the creative thing started to happen with George with with all of them. And, you know, you, when you were talking about Paul, an interesting thing that 
I don't think has ever really been discussed is did John feel maybe not threatened, but did he realize that Paul was becoming such an immense talent? You know, could he see that Paul was becoming what exactly what he is now? I think it was evident from the very beginning, from 1964, when they were on that Ed Sullivan stage, everybody knew that Paul was going to be huge at some point. Maybe not as huge as he, as he is now. But early on, the reason why he let Paul join the band was to strengthen the band. Right. He knew that the two of them together could really be something powerful, and they were. So, to is, John's credit, he didn't just say, no, I want it to be just me and a few other guys that are my backup musicians. He wanted someone in there who had a lot of musical ability and he could see a future with. Right. But the question is, do you think he, he, forecast, he could have forecast exactly how big of a talent Paul was going to be? No. And I, you know, it's just like... There's no way on earth that any of the Beatles would have known that they were going to be as big as they were. Nobody knows that in the very beginning. The chances of any group becoming as big as the Beatles, it's, 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 so, it's a million to one odds. No, uh, it's, and, that, and that's true. I think, though, that it was very evident um, back in 64 that Paul was going to be huge. Paul was going to be, I mean, he, wasn't, he was going to be, number one, he was going to be bigger than Ringo. Everybody knew that. I don't know. Ringo, Ringo was very popular. Uh, to some people, he was the most popular early on. That's true. Because That's of his true. name, because of his personality, because he was the drummer in the back, because of the rings on his fingers. All those, all those um, reasons uh, contributed to his popularity. That's true, but Paul did get a lot of attention. He was, he, you know, he was the cute beetle for what that was worth back then. He was the one, he was the one that the girls were all after. It just seems to me that, that there was a, an, an, uh, an attraction. He was a magnet, and that everybody, and that there was a lot of attention put on Paul, and Paul knew it. And he knew that he was going to be big. He knew I, he, I, Yeah, well, I agree with you to some extent, but I think there was a lot of attention given to each of the four of them. Oh, they, there was. They made every effort to make sure that all four names, all four personalities were established. You always heard John Paul George and Ringo. You never they heard it was not. John and three other guys. It was never that. And just that fact alone, and the fact that they always made sure that Ringo had a vocal on every album, and the fact that they let Ringo stand out in their movies and A Hard Day's Night and Help and Magical Mystery Tour. <laughs> you know, they, that was, I think that, that really helped to solidify the fact that all four of them had personalities of their own and identities all their own, and they were very conscious of that as they were doing it. I, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. I'm just, I'm just saying that even back in 64, Paul had this attraction, and that he still has today. I mean, there are, Paul fan, there are die-hard Paul fans, fanatical Paul fans today. Right. Um, there's fanatical fans for, for all, all four Beatles, but especially for Paul. Especially for Paul. Hmm. So uh, you, you think if all if John and George were alive today, that Paul would still be the most popular? Yes, I do. Hmm. I absolutely do. Especially it's it's very given, possible. Especially given Paul's empire, the you know MPL and and the way he has furthered his career, I think that goes without saying. I mean, he's certainly doing more than than even though Ringo is touring. He's certainly way ahead of, of Ringo. Not, I'm not necessarily talking about money, although that's obviously true. But in uh, his celebrity, he's a much bigger. He's a huge celebrity. And of course, with you know, John and George gone, there isn't much they can do. But he's one of the biggest celebrities in the world today. He's huge. Well, you know? I think that's that's. A lot of that just has to do with his sheer talent and how True. he's conducted himself in his career and the judgments that he's made in the music that he's released and when he tours and the projects that he does. And how rich he is. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can be very rich and still be not popular. 
True. I mean, I can think of a couple of people uh, on that score, too. But Let's not yeah, go there. Right. Let's, not. <laughs> Let's not go there. But, you know, I would like to close this conversation by just saying, you know, with all the different reasons why the Beatles broke up, and you talk to the fans, too, they'll give you their own take of what they very firmly believe was the biggest reason. I think, in many ways, what Yoko has said probably makes more sense than what anyone has said, which is there was too much talent to keep contained in that band. And really, that's a powerful statement, but it's true. They're all four uniquely gifted, extremely talented individuals, and they've proven that through their solo music, and they were absolutely incredible when they were together, but there's only so long you can keep the four of them together where they're not allowed to branch off and do things on their own. And also, this is another factor. Uh, there came a time, I'm trying to remember when it was, it was probably like in the, the mid-70s, when you would have a group and you would have an individual have a solo career at the same time, simultaneously. That didn't really happen then when the Beatles broke up. Maybe if that was allowed, even though you still had the, the John and Yoko albums, Two Virgins and Unfinished Music, and George had Wonderwall music, uh, those weren't really considered pop albums. But I'm saying when the time came when you had groups like the Eagles, for example, when they branched out, or Genesis, and you had the careers going on at the same time, it was more acceptable then. Right. Maybe, maybe if that actually existed in 1970, when they publicly broke up, then maybe they could have continued and, and did both. But still, they were really branching out, each of the four of them, artistically in different directions. There's a lot of songs, for example, that George Harrison did that I, I couldn't really see Paul McCartney being a part of, especially a lot of his spiritual stuff. No, they definitely went off on their own, in their own areas. Right. Uh, once the, the band had actually broken up. Hmm. And, I mean, that's not surprising would have happened that would have happened anyway but this yeah. whole idea so many years later that anybody holds a grudge against yoko or thinks that way it's just so backwards thinking at this at this point i mean in the long run yoko made john happy and if you really support john then you have to support yoko at the same time and i'm not saying like i said before that you have to support her work but you know, the two of them were married, and that was John's choice, and John had the right to do what he wanted to do. And I think a, another reason why people don't take to Yoko very well is because she was kind of forced on the fans. It wasn't just a matter of the two of them got married. They did projects together. They appeared in public together. They did interviews together. It was always John with Yoko. And I think a lot of fans felt uh, resentment towards that. Well, again, you know, a lot of people think of her as a control freak, and I think that's part of the resentment, too. And however she conducts her affairs, especially now, since she's in charge of the one in the state, hmm. um, that really shouldn't have anything to do with anything. I mean, she put out more archival material really over the course since John has died than the Beatles did. She was putting out unreleased Lennon material before the uh, anthology came out. Mm -hmm. And she's been, although she hasn't done a whole lot in the past few years, I mean, there was a time when she was putting out a ton of stuff. And she also allowed for the lost Lennon tapes, which was absolutely fantastic. Yeah. I'm most grateful for that than probably anything else that Yoko's done since John died. Because she heard so much unreleased John Lennon songs, different takes of John Lennon music, different mixes, different interviews. And we all got to listen every single week on that radio right. show. And, of course, there's the Lennon anthology box set, which I love. There's a lot of stuff that was in the Lost Lennon tapes that hasn't been released yet. It wasn't even in right. the anthology box. So... I think hopefully that'll come out in the future officially, though it's been bootlegged. But uh, I'm, I'm very grateful for the way that, that Yoko has handled herself in putting out all kinds of things, like the John Lennon Letters book that we right. will be doing a show on very soon. Very soon. And, and that one, other, one other song that 
song Walking on Thin Ice hmm. that they were working on the night John was killed is a brilliant piece of music. I don't yeah. care if you don't like Yoko, that is a brilliant piece of music between her vocal and his counter guitar work. Those I stinging mean, guitar uh, solos yes, there? Yeah. That, that is an incredible song. Hmm. And she deserves credit for that as much as he does. Because you know, it's such a great song. There are times, and you can apply this to a lot of artists, if you didn't have the built in prejudice that some people have towards Yoko, if somebody played her song, and you didn't know it was her, and it, you were told it was, name any generic name. <laughs> Some people may actually like it if they weren't already told it was Yoko. And they have, because her dance mixes have gone, have been, you know, number one hits on Billboard. That's right. So there's a whole so, new audience out there that are discovering her talent. Mm -hmm. And those are the people that don't have this built-in prejudice. Well, again, we're... we're Prejudice may be the wrong word, but this feeling or resentment or I don't know, whatever you want to call it. But, yeah, there's, you know, the bad feeling against Yoko or the, the I guess bad feeling is probably the best word to use. But, yes, yes. The dance, the dance audience that is sending her stuff to the top of the charts really doesn't care that much about the Beatles. They care about her. And that's. As it should That's be. It. And she's furthered her career with her artwork. She's doing art exhibits uh, all over the all over the globe. The great, uh, the wish wish tree. Um, the imagined the peace tree, tower. The peace tower. That that in itself is astounding. That mm. is such a great idea. And there's just so many things that she's done. And I, I'm we're not sitting here. You know, doing a, a praise Yoko show. That's not the idea. No. But the idea is that she deserves credit for what she's done. And there's always art displays that right. that are shown to the public periodically. I went to see the uh, the John Lennon display at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland, and I was just amazed by it. Three whole floors of Lennon memorabilia and uh, his handwritten lyrics. I mean, I love the fact that she's sharing that with the fans. I, I saw the uh, Grammy Museum exhibit that's uh, gone now. It's, but th that was a much smaller exhibit. It was only, uh, it was only a, in a couple of, in a small area. And actually it was right next to, when, when we saw it, it was right next to the Roy Orbison exhibit, which was also very cool. But yeah, it was much of the same stuff mm. in there. And, yeah, it's great that she's allowed all this stuff to get out and to be exhibited. And so she deserves a lot of credit for sharing that stuff. I agree with you. So to summarize what we've been discussing, I really, um, I really love the fact that, that Paul is giving Yoko the credit here. And um, like you said, Steve, this is not the first time you said this about Yoko not being responsible for the breakup of the Beatles, but as far as giving her credit for being such a powerful influence on John and, and his music, I applaud him for doing that. I'm really glad that he did. And maybe this is a new uh, era of peace between him and Yoko, because they have been at odds before. And maybe this is you know, the beginning of an understanding. And, I, and hopefully, hopefully it is. I think they've kind of come to groups with each other, and they've they know that there's going to be times when they're going to be facing off on pro Beatle projects, and every it's every man for himself in those <laughs> Beatle projects. And she's you know she's pulling for John's interests and he's pulling for his, and it's like it's like American politics. Sometimes the two don't meet, but they respect each other, and that's a good that's a good thing. That's right. really a good thing. And that's a good way to end this conversation. Before we close, we want to let everybody know that we have a brand new email address that you can write to us at, which is... Right. Things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. And okay. uh, we each have our own Facebook pages. And we also have a Things We Said Today Facebook page. In addition to that... We're also encouraging you, because we're looking for a theme song for this show that we can open and close with, if you'd like to submit original material and instrumental 
that is somewhat Beatlesque, where we will play the most about 30 seconds of it in the show at the beginning and at the end, then by all means, please write to us. Once again, the email address is things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. And if you can, please check out my website, which is kenmichaelsradio.com with lots of interviews with people connected to the Beatles and uh, trivia every single week, along with great prizes to boot. And if people want to read your column, Steve, they need to go where? Go to examiner.com and search for Beatles Examiner or search for my name, uh, Steve Marinucci. And uh, I write not only Beatles Examiner, but I write three solo examiner, Beatles solo examiner columns, plus uh, vintage rock and roll, plus TV on DVD. So I'm busy all the time. He never uh, stops writing. When I'm watch- when I'm not watching baseball, <laughs> which is hard to do now that the season is over, but I don't know. I'll find a way to do it somehow. I guess. You didn't record uh, the Giants games. You're not going to no, play them actually, back during I, the off season. Actually, I have. Uh, I had MLB TV the last month of the season, uh, and I can replay the game. I can replay the whole season actually, depending on what day, I, how far back I want to go. I, I can see the World Series. And as I reported the other day, the series will be out uh, on DVD by Christmas, sometime in November, actually. Okay. So this is Ken Michaels, along with Steve Marinucci, saying thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you next time. See you next time.